Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's Chemistry Webcast. In this webcast, we're learning how to write names and formulas for binary ionic compounds that contain type 1 cations. Whew, that's quite the mouthful. It's a really, really important skill for beginning chemistry students. You can't be too good at this, so we're going to do a lot of practice problems. So what do we want to accomplish in this webcast? What do you need to learn? We're going to start by naming monatomic ions, monatomic type 1 cations, and monatomic anions. Now, when I say monatomic, what I mean is they're ions that are formed from a single atom that gained or lost a number of electrons. That's all monatomic means. We'll talk about what I mean by type 1 cations shortly, but not quite yet. We need to learn to write formulas for these binary ionic compounds that contain type 1 cations. Again, there's a lot to unpack there. And we're going to learn to name them, all right? So nomenclature of ionic compounds. Now, the system of nomenclature that we look that we're learning that we use it's called stock notation it's not about knowing that it's called stock notation but it is really important that you know how these systems work because if you can write formulas for binary ionic compounds correctly and you can name them correctly when we get into doing more complicated ionic compounds that have more stuff going on we're going to use the same thought processes and the same logic so these are really fundamental skills and as i promised there will be lots of practice problems so let's start by talking about what we mean by binary ionic compounds. The word binary, two. Binary compounds contain two different elements. That's all it means, two different elements. I'm not saying how many atoms of each element are present. I'm just saying there are two different elements in the compound. Now, specifically when we're talking about binary ionic compounds, we're talking about compounds that are formed from a metal, and a nonmetal. Metals tend to lose electrons and form cations, which are positively charged. And nonmetals tend to gain electrons, which form anions, which are negatively charged. And now we have oppositely charged species, and they're attracted to each other, and they come together to form a stable compound. So a binary ionic compound has two elements. One's a metal, one's a nonmetal. Now our goal is to write a correct chemical formula based on the cation that's formed and the anion that's formed, the ions that are interacting, and put them together to write a compound that is electrically neutral. And so we need to show the numbers and kinds of each atom or ion present to get that smallest correct unit that is neutral. That's a really important idea that the compound is neutral. If you don't remember chemical formulas or you need to brush up your skills, I've got a whole webcast on that. I'll toss the link up when I upload this. So we're going to start by learning how to name type 1 metal cations. What do you mean by type 1? Type 1 just means it's an ion that only has a single charge. That element, when it forms an ion, just does one thing. All right, that's what our textbook calls those kinds of cations. So the group 1 metals and the group 2 metals form type 1 metal cations, which means they only form one charge each. And for these elements, the metal name is the name of the cation as well. So as a reminder, the group 1 metals form plus 1 cations. Please go ahead and write plus 1 above group 1 on your periodic table. The group 2 elements form plus 2 cations. Write a plus 2 above group 2 on your periodic table. We see this pattern again and again. It's the only thing the group 1 metals and the group 2 metals do. And that's why we're calling them type 1 metal cations. And the metal name gives us the cation name. It's that simple. So lithium plus, Li plus, is lithium ion right? Straight from its element name. Mg2 plus is magnesium ion, and it goes in the opposite direction as well. But you just look on the periodic table and whatever the element name is, you just, you can toss ion onto the end of it. Simple, simple, simple. Now besides our group one and group two elements, which are considered type one cations, there are a few other metals that are considered to be type one cations. They only form one charge, and the common examples of this are silver, zinc, aluminum. Silver only ever forms a plus one ion. So go ahead and write plus one on silver. Zinc only forms a plus two ion. Go ahead and write plus two on zinc. Cadmium often does a plus two as well. It's the most common charge. And the group 13 elements, aluminum and gallium, only do plus three. And so you can go ahead and write that on your periodic table as well. Notice there's also a, tr a progression here. Plus one, plus two to plus three as you go on that upwards diagonal from silver to zinc to aluminum can be a very helpful mnemonic. You do need to know these three elements and their charges, right? And you need to ask your teacher if they want you to consider cadmium a type 1 cation. 
if they want you to consider gallium a plus one cation. Every teacher has their own little preferences on that and you need to make sure you're doing what your teacher wants. All right, now let's go on and talk about how to name monatomic anions. Now we've talked in my classes about how the group 17 elements, the halogens, always form minus one charges for a monatomic ion. The group 16 elements do minus two. Now what we hadn't really talked about, but turns out to be really handy to know, is that the group 15 elements, the nitrogen family, they tend to form minus three ions when they form a monatomic ion. So you can write minus three, minus two, minus one for groups 15, 16, 17. And that might be really helpful to you. Knowing where these elements are in the periodic table helps you to predict, predict what kinds of ions they'll form. Now to name these, you change the end of the element name, you drop those last few letters or sometimes more than one syllable and you change the ending to ide. So chlorine, when it's a neutral atom or an element, we call it chlorine, but when it forms an anion with a charge of minus one, we say it's chloride. These are not interchangeable. Chlorine and chloride are not the same thing. Cl versus Cl minus. So you really have to pay attention to that. Similarly, phosphorus, notice it's in group 15 right under nitrogen, right? Tends to form a minus three ion. We call it the phosphide ion. So we're dropping the last two syllables and changing that to ide. So it's very common for our monatomic anions. All our monatomic anions end with this ide ending. Ide means an anion here. All right, so let's do some practice just naming monatomic ions. Get your periodic table handy. You need to be able to look at the element names, but hopefully you've been practicing the names and symbols of the elements and you can do some of this from memory, but you've got your table there to back you up. Se2 minus, look where that is, selenium, but it's the anion, so it's selenide. Zn2 plus, that's the zinc ion. It's a type one cation. Calcium two plus, that's the calcium ion. We don't need to indicate the charge. We know what the charges are, so we don't need to add that information in. Ag plus, that's the silver ion. So these type one cations, the idea is that we know what the charge is, so we don't need to tell you. Isn't that kind of a funny system? But that's really the way it works. S2 minus, that's the sulfide ion. So the ending name for the anions goes to ide. And our type one cations, the element name is the cation name. And one more example on this slide, N3 minus would be the nitride ion. Notice that ide ending for the anions. So now that we know our monatomic cations and our monatomic anions, let's start thinking about how to put them together to write neutral compounds. What you need to do is write the cation with its charge, and then next to it, write the anion with its charge. It's really important to have the correct charges here. And then we're trying to get electrically neutral compounds. So we can put subscripts in, but we're going to pick our subscripts so that the sum of the positive charges equals the sum of the negative charges. I need the sum of the charges to be zero overall. One way to do this is to look at the lowest common multiple of the charges and use that to figure out the subscripts. But the goal is to have a compound whose charge is zero when you add up all of the ions. The other thing that I need to point out is that the charges themselves of the ions don't show up in the formula, all right? Just how many of each type. Now for naming ionic compounds, which is something else we wanna practice, what we do is we list the cation name and then the anion name, and that's it. You just cation, anion, always in that order. You'll notice it's always metal, non-metal, cation, anion. So let's do a practice problem together. We're gonna to be very thorough and show you all the steps. We want the formula and the correct name of the compound that forms between potassium and oxygen. Notice we have a metal and a non-metal. So we look on our periodic table and we see that potassium is a group one metal and group one metals always form plus one ion. So I'm going to write the symbol for the potassium ion, K plus. And then I'm looking on my table and I see that oxygen's in group 16 we know the group 16 elements always form ions with a minus two charge. So I'll write that symbol, O2 minus. Are we ready to go here? If they're going to react in a one-to-one -one ratio, will the sum of the charges be zero? And the answer is no. Plus one and minus two do not add up to zero. So what can I do to fix this? All right, I've got two minuses. Don't I need two pluses? Well, the easiest way to get two pluses would be to bring in another potassium ion. Ah. Now K plus and K plus and O2 minus, oh, now the sum of my charges is zero. So I need two potassiums for that oxide so that I get a neutral compound. So my formula would be K2O. 
So two potassiums, one oxide. And the name, potassium oxide, cation, anion. Note that there's no information in the name about needing two potassium ions. That's not what we do here. All right. Let's do another example. Give the correct name and formula of the binary ionic compound that forms between aluminum metal and fluorine. So aluminum, we look on our periodic table. It's a group 13 element. And we just talked about how they always form plus three ions. So we'll write an aluminum ion. And fluorine is a group 17 element. We know the fluorine, the halogens always form minus one ion. So I'm going to write F minus because that's what the halogens do to make a halide ion. And I'm looking at the sum of the charges. If these guys react in a one-to-one -one ratio, if they combine one aluminum ion to one fluoride ion, will the sum of the charges be zero? And the answer is no. I've got three pluses and one minus. Plus three minus one is not zero. So I could use some extra minus charges, some extra negatively charged ions, some fluoride ions, if I had two more. That gives me three positives and now three negatives. Ah, that works. So my compound would be ALF3. And the name? Aluminum fluoride. Again, no information about how many atoms. And now we're going to do several more problems to write names and formulas for some compounds because you can't be too good at this. You really need to practice this and know how to do it and do it accurately and reliably and fairly quickly. So if we have an element, sodium, reacting with nitrogen, right? Now we know sodium is group one. It's going to form a plus one ion. Nitrogen is a group 15 element. They're going to form minus three ions. So one to one ratio won't work. But if I have three sodiums for my nitride, Na3N, that gives me a neutral compound, right? So notice that I need the subscript of three with the sodium. And the name, sodium nitride, because it's my cation name and then my anion name. So another example, strontium metal reacting with bromine atoms, right? So strontium is a group two element, typical charge is plus two. Bromine, when it forms a monatomic ion, have a minus one charge, the bromide ion. So I'm going to need two bromide ions to counteract the plus two charges from the strontium. So I'm going to write SRBR2 and the name strontium bromide. Okay. See, this is really very doable, right? We can do it. And you're just going to keep practicing and practicing and practicing until you're good at it. And you're going to go get extra help if it's not clicking for you. The compound that would form between aluminum and sulfur. So aluminum, group 13 element, is charges plus three for the typical ion. Sulfur is a group 16 element. Its typical monatomic ion charge would be minus two. Now, again, if they come together in a one-to-one -one ratio, that doesn't add up to zero. Plus three minus two is definitely not zero. This is a good time to think about the lowest common multiple. The lowest common multiple of three and two would be six. So how, how could I get plus six? Oh, I could do two aluminums. And I could get negative six by having three sulfides. And so the compound would be Al2S3. And the name would be aluminum sulfide. Notice nothing about how many in the name. Compound between lithium and phosphorus. Lithium is a group one element, plus one charge. Phosphorus, group 15 element, minus three is its typical charge. Again, one to one ratio isn't going to work for me here. But if I have three lithium ions, that counteracts the negative three charge of the phosphide ion. So Li3P and my compound name is lithium phosphide. You think you're done? Mm -mm, let's do some more practice. All right, you cannot be too good at this. The compound that forms between silver and sulfur. This is actually believed to be the compound involved in tarnish. Silver is a plus one ion. It's the only thing it does. Remember, it's a type one cation. Sulfur is a group 16 element. Its typical charge is minus two. But if I have two plus one ions for silver, that will counteract the negative two charge of the sulfide. So Ag2S is my compound formula, and the name is silver sulfide. And I promise one more example. The reaction between aluminum and oxygen to form a compound. Aluminum is a group 13 element. Its charge is plus three. Oxide is minus two. 
Ah, here we go back where the lowest common multiple can really help us, which would be six again. So if I have two aluminums, it gives me a total of plus six. If I have three oxides, it gives me a total of minus six. I add that together, that's neutral. So my compound is Al2O3. And the name, aluminum oxide. And you're going to keep practicing and practicing these skills until you can do it comfortably and reliably and accurately because you're going to build on this in your classes as we get into more involved compounds. So let's summarize what we've done in this webcast. Type 1 cations are named after their elements. So the type 1 cations are in groups 1 and 2, and they also include silver and zinc and aluminum. The monatomic anions, when we name them, we drop the last letters and change it to ide. When we write formulas, we always write the cation first and then the anion. We write the metal and then the nonmetal. We choose the subscript so that the overall charge of the compound will be zero. So all the positives add up to all the negatives and give us zero. And to name the binary ionic compounds, we give the cation name and then the anion name. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please consider subscribing to my channel, leave a comment, and keep learning chemistry.